Okay, so for months now, you guys have been asking me, do another embalming video, Carrie, please do one. Well, I finally thought of a kind of creative idea to show you the embalming process without any bodies. So today we're going to walk through a standard embalming. We're not going to factor in the thousands of things that can change the chemical or component makeup of a body that embalmer has to factor in on a daily basis. You know, all the chemicals that we put into our body from, you know, food and drugs and exposure to things are factored in. We're not going to look at any of that today. We're not going to look at edema or jaundice, things of that nature. So just a straightforward embalming, but we're going to break down the different steps for you and give you more of a visual of what that's going to look like. So the best way I figured to do this was I'm going to be the body and I'm going to talk you through what our embalmer, Chris, who you met in the trade embalming video, would be doing to me. So when I first come in, I would be moved onto the table. Today I have a sheet on the table. Typically it's a stainless steel or a porcelain table that the body is on. So I would be here and I, my mouth typically would be open and my eyes would probably be open and I may be in some sort of rigor and so as it's worded that means you have rigor mortis in your muscle in your tissue so your hands might be you know all over your fists might be clenched um, but your hands might be in a, the wrong spot so one of the first things is that the embalmer will come in and will position the body how they want the body. As we've talked in previous videos, typically we're going to try and get hands on the abdomen, wedding ring hand over the other hand, kind of head tilted. So then we're going to, the embalmer would then sanitize me, including my eyes, nose, mouth. And particularly in the mouth is important because that's one of the first places that the body is going to decompose is down through the trachea and the esophagus because of all the bacteria. So you want to make sure that is all cleaned out. So the next thing the embalmer would be doing to me is setting my features. He would then use, or she would then use, the eye caps under the lids of my eyes to close the eyes. Then would close my mouth. Now there's a few different ways that the embalmer could do this. There's a needle injector and a suture. So it would depend on their preferred method that they use. So the needle injector, you actually implant a metal wire into the top jaw and the bottom jaw. So you'd go here, and here in the mouth and inject the needle. The wire fits in just like that into the little groove. And then this is a pistol grip needle injector. So all you simply have to do is once the injector wire is in the 
mechanism. You will put this up against the mandible or the maxilla, whichever one you're doing first. Then you'll pull this trigger here and that will hammer it into position. Then the suture method, which is my preferred method of mouth closure. You can do a few different ways. Some people like to go through the tendon that's in the front of the mouth and just loop that. However, that's going to soften and decompose pretty quickly. So I like to go through for the mandibular. So you use a suture needle and thread and you actually go in through bottom down here, up, out the mouth, and then you go up behind the lip and you come out one nostril, you break through, go down the other nostril and come back out. So then you're creating a loop around the bottom bone and a loop around the septum, the mandible and the septum, and it bone is not going to decompose that that suture is going to break through. So that's why it's my preferred method of mouth closure. So the embalmer will do an assessment of the person's body. They will look for jaundice, edema, any um, tissue gas that may be started, any skin slip, things that they're going to need to factor in mixing of the fluids. And so then they'll choose kind of what their formula is going to be for the fluid solution. I've mentioned before, but you do typically one gallon for every 50 pounds of body weight of the person. And that is your fluid plus water to equal that one gallon solution. So today for me, Chris will be mixing up, or will theoretically be mixing up, three gallons of fluid. Okay, as Carrie mentioned in mixing up the fluids, we first do a case analysis of the body just to see what kind of um, situation we're dealing with. There are a variety of fluids, as you can see, that we have to choose from, and there are lots more than what we have pictured here. Um, they're broken down into main categories. We have our arterial preservative chemicals, and those are the actual either formaldehyde or glutaraldehyde chemicals that are going to preserve the tissues. We have some co-injection chemicals, and these are things um, uh, that will break up clots and neutralize the pH within the body and help those uh, tissues receive the fluids and form those bonds to preserve the tissues. And then we have also uh, cavity fluid, which is a very strong um, formaldehyde-based fluid, and that's what we use in the uh, thoracic and abdominal cav cavities um, to kill all of the bacteria that are located within there. Um, some fluids are built in with dye. Uh, PK is one of my favorites. It has a very nice active dye, but sometimes you do need to add a little dye to give the body um, more of a natural look. So there are a couple different dyes available um, to do that. All right, so our case analysis of my friend Carrie here, who I'm embalming, very sadly. Um, she's a very standard and normal case. So in my mix, I use about a half a bottle of the water corrective. That's called PHA, and that's going to, again, um, neutralize the water, uh, help break up clots, things like that. So that will go in the, in the tank. Also some Metaflow, and that just kind of loosens things up again, helps break up the clots, and helps distribution and diffusion of the fluid. Um, the chemical I've chosen, because um, she's a relatively normal case, is PK. It's got, like I said, a nice active dye. It's red. Um, it'll preserve things nicely. We're going to add that to the, the tank, and we're also going to add just a little bit more of another chemical, just to kind of boost the effectiveness of the fluid. So that's going to be my starting solution to about three gallons of water. Um, we're going to start injecting that fluid and see how it goes. And if we need to add more, uh, we'll certainly do so. And the best way to do this to um, protect the embalmer from the fumes is to fill the tank first and then put your fluid in so the water doesn't aerosolize those fumes. All right, this is the embalming machine that's going to pump the fluid through the system. And I'm going to describe some of the knobs and dials and gauges and that that are located on here. First is the on-off switch. We have off, of course. Mix, which is just going to run the chemicals through the system and mix it all so it's a nice solution. 
Um, there's a pulse feature and a direct feature. I'll get to those here in a moment. Um, most machines have a pressure gauge. Um, I have found in my work and all the funeral homes that I work for, about half of them work and about half of them don't. I tend to like to embalm with the highest pressure possible, but again, sometimes I don't have that luxury because the gauge doesn't work. Um, the most important is the rate of flow meter because too fast of a rate of flow, you're going to have problems with your embalming. You're gonna swell features, you're gonna swell everything. So you wanna have a nice moderate rate of flow. We've already attached the cannula or arterial tube to the hose, which goes to the machine. This is what's going to be inserted into the artery and what's going to um, feed the uh, fluid into the system. So currently I have it set to mix, so all that solution is mixing at the moment. I'm going to turn it over to direct, and that's going to do a direct stream of fluid. Now we look at our rate of flow meter and we're well over 20 ounces per minute, which for a starting uh, rate is a little bit high. I tend to start my injection around 8, 15 to 18 and I will often just eyeball that because sometimes the machines don't have a rate of flow meter. We're lucky on this one that it does. But we want the, to have a gentle um, stream and arc to it. Not too fast, not too slow. And again, that is just about 15 ounces per minute. Now we can also utilize the pulse um, feature, which I use on traumatic cases sometimes. And that just mimics the heartbeat if a person were alive and injects it in periodic bursts. So one thing we need to discuss is breasts. I know, right? So most embalmers on a female will pull the breasts together to make sure they are not defy, you know, they can defy gravity a little bit in the casket. So some will suture and they will use a suture and needle and sew the breasts together at the nipples. Some will use a clamp to hook the breasts and pull them up together, right? Uh, some will use duct tape and then remove that following the embalming once the breasts have kind of firmed and set into place. So there is a lot of different techniques when it comes to that to get the breasts into the right place so that way they're not dropped down into the armpit area or up in the neck area if they are large breasts um, for the viewing. So now the embalmer has mixed all the fluid up. Now I need to be injected with the embalming fluid. So the embalmer is going to make the incision on me. The preferred place of choice is the carotid artery here where you're also going to get the jugular vein for the drainage. So the embalmer would make an incision for the carotid artery. Pretty on the clavicle there. We also then a lot of embalmers will use the bra strap incision. I've talked about this in videos before. This is so that you can raise the carotid and the subclavian arteries in one incision. Now that I've made the incision in the area that I want to raise the vessels at, I need to dissect through that tissue. And we use what are called aneurysm hooks. And they're blunt-ended dissection devices that are gonna cut through the fascia, any of the fat that might be there, and any of the muscle tissue to get us right into that area that contains um, the two vessels that we're looking for. Sorry the jugular vein and the carotid artery and they run just about like that side by side. As I'm raising a vessel, I will just gently dissect through that tissue as I work my way medial to the body because the vessels run from earlobe to right that part of the clavicle. So we're going to know that we're going right into this area to find the vessel. So we'll gently dissect through that tissue until we find what we're looking for and then we'll uh, clean the connective tissue off that and we'll raise it onto our hook and tie a, um, a short piece of ligature around that so we can access that when we're ready to inject. Now we have our vessels raised. Um, now I need to insert the cannula or the arterial tube into the artery. Obviously this is 
not going to really go into her artery, but um, these hemos, these hemostats here, are designed to uh, clasp around the um, tube. So we will stick that into the artery and clamp it down. We'll actually use a little bit tighter one to hold that into place. And once that's in place, this stopcock will be turned into the open position and fluid will be free flowing into the system. Um, after, uh, after about a half a gallon has been injected into the system, I start with a closed system. I will open up the jugular vein that we raised along with the carotid artery. And every embalmer is different. Every embalmer has their preferences. Some of us use um, angular forceps to in, uh, insert into the jugular vein. That will pull the clots out and also open it up wide enough to uh, facilitate the drainage. Some embalmers prefer to use a drain tube. This again will go right into the vein and there are holes here as you um, pull the plunger back and forth it will um, close drainage and open drainage so you have an opportunity for intermittent drainage with that device and then it, a hose is normally attached to that runs down the table. It is a little bit cleaner um, I still, however, prefer this way. It works better for me. Like I say, every embalmer is a little bit different in their preferences. All right, so during the injection of the arterial fluid into the system, I'm going to take this opportunity to um, do some cleaning of the body. I'm going to wash Carrie's hair, and we just use regular shampoo and conditioner. Um, we use a disinfectant soap, which is sprayed all throughout the, the body. And then we um, wash everything with a sponge. And this serves two purposes. One is to disinfect and the other is to help promote distribution. So as we're washing, we're also um, pushing the, um, with firmness, pushing the fluid up toward the heart and helping that fluid to um, distribute throughout her system. Um, especially important here to work on the fingertips you want to make sure that fluid makes it all the way down to the very fingertip, all the way down the legs. And as I'm embalming her, I'm seeing a couple of issues, and these sometimes arise. Sometimes the body will distribute perfectly. Other times you might have a lack of distribution to one leg. One leg is perfect. The other has not got any fluid. One hand might not have fluid. So in those cases, I need to raise the vessels that are closest to that area in order to direct um, fluid directly down that area. So in this case, her right leg is not taking fluid. So I'm going to use my scalpel and I'm going to make an incision right over her femoral artery. And the femoral artery is located just about there. And we're going to again use those same instruments to raise those vessels, dissect through the tissue, raise the femoral. We will remove the cannula from the carotid Adjust our rate of flow just a little bit. We'll turn it down so it's not coming through quite as quickly. And we'll inject that right into the femoral so that fluid will go down that way. Another common site that we have to raise um, is the, uh, the radial artery because the hands will sometimes not clear. We want finger uh, nail beds to clear and things like that. So I will make an incision over her radial artery and this is a very superficial artery this is where you feel your pulse or the nurse does when she takes your pulse um, so it's actually right about here and you can feel in between a couple tendons and I just make a very small incision right there and then I'll pull up and it's a very small artery so I will have to change my arterial tube to a smaller size reduce my rate of flow even further and then inject that hand which will only take a few seconds. The overall process of injecting arterial fluid is probably about 20 to 25 minutes even though the embalming may, the entire embalming process may take an hour to an hour and a half. Once we have finished the arterial injection it's time to do the cavity work and we're going to use um, a hydro aspirator and this is connected to a water supply and it's just a rubber hose that I'm going to um, hook up to our trocar. Some of you may have heard of a trocar. And this is um, a hollow tube with a sharp end that I'm going to hook onto um, the hydro aspirator. We'll just turn on the water here. 
So that's creating a suction. There's a suction coming from the hose. The hose will end, will hook right onto the trocar. Um, and this trocar is going to be inserted. And what I will do is move her arms out of the way for a moment. And right near the belly button, it's about two inches over and two inches up. And we make a little poke right there. And the trocar will make its way right up into the heart area, withdraw any fluids that have collected up there into the lungs. Some people have fluid in the lungs from pneumonia or CHF. We'll aspirate all those out. We'll create some channels because we want to inject the cavity fluid that I mentioned earlier into those areas. So once we're happy with the upper thoracic area, we'll turn the trocar and use that same point and do the lower areas of the abdomen. And that's the intestines, liver, kidneys, bladder, uh, everything like that. We'll want to spend a very good amount of time aspirating the fluids out of that area and also creating the channels again necessary to distribute that cavity chemical. So now we're, we've finished the aspirating and we're going to inject the cavity fluid. Um, the cavity injector tube is just a short tube that gets hooked directly to the cavity fluid bottle. And where did my short car go? gets um, hooked to the cavity fluid bottle and then into the trocar and then we would inject that cavity fluid again into the um, thoracic and abdominal cavities that we just aspirated. We will seal that hole with what's called a trocar button. It's just a very small piece of plastic with threads and it will screw itself right into that hole to close that seal. Sometimes the trocar button is a little too small or it won't connect. Um, with the tissues. In that case, we just make a small and, um, suture around it and tie that tight with the suture. In addition to closing up the um, trocar hole, we need to close up the incisions that we started with um, and the ones that we raised subsequently. I will use um, what's called an S-curve needle. It gives me good leverage. It fits my hand and um, allow me to do a nice tight suture and then we have some ligature tied to that. So we're going to just make a, um, a needle poke through the incision, pull that through and tie the suture cord so it makes an anchor onto the uh, skin and then we do what's called a baseball stitch underneath each side of the incision back and forth, back and forth Add a little bit of incision seal powder, which is going to create a gel if any liquid is there and keep the liquid from coming out the incision. Um, then we're going to finish sewing as tightly as we can and then tie that suture cord off. Do the same thing with the femoral incision that we raised down here. And then again, that radial incision that we did right here too. Okay, so we have the injection complete, the cavity work complete. We've sewed up all the incisions. We're going to give the body a final wash with our disinfectant soap. So we'll go ahead and wash everything. We'll condition her hair if we didn't have time to do that already. We should have washed it already one time. Um, so we'll wash, condition the hair, wash the body. Um, it's really imperative that you clean every, everything. So even fingernails need to be cleaned. You need to go through each one because you don't know what's under those fingernails or where those fingers have been. So. Um, most everyone has at least a little nose hair. Um, I use hemostats to pluck nose hairs. Carrie, my friend here, has no nose hair whatsoever. <laughs> but I've seen people that look like a forest. So I go ahead and I clean that up with my hemos. If it's a man, they might have hairy ears. I'll pluck all those hairs as well and make sure that's all good. And just about everybody also needs to be shaved. We just use a regular disposable razor. Women, men, most everyone has at least a little fuzz there. Always wanting to make sure that we have proper um, permission to shave. You never know what kind of style of beard or goatee they have. So I'm going to make sure that there's no little loose hairs because any cosmetics will cling right to that hair. And when you have the person in the casket and out for viewing, when someone comes up, they might be able to see it. So 
always make sure to shave. Since the dead human body doesn't have any circulation to keep the moisture in, we're going to add a layer of emollient to the face. And this is Kalon cream, just a brand that a lot of places use. It's a white cream, very thick, and we've actually put it on with a paintbrush. So we will put a nice amount on there and then spread this all over the tissues of the face. The thinner the tissue, the quicker it's going to dehydrate. So lips and eyelids and things like that, you want to give a nice liberal coat to. Our embalming is, for the most part, complete. We want to make sure our decedent is properly covered, respectfully, and ready to be dressed and casketed once that time comes. So that is our breakdown of what happens during an embalming. A little brief introduction on the fluids and all the steps that take place when we do an embalming. So hopefully more questions were answered for you while I got embalmed here today. And by all means, make sure you post your questions below. Make sure you comment, like, share the video, and I will see you guys on the next video soon about embalming and dressing of bodies.